One of the most important and most challenging things to do in all of group theory is to be able to say something, anything, about the structure of an unknown group. If I can't wrap my hands completely around the group, if I can't, for example, list out all of its elements, or even if I can list out all of its elements, maybe I can't list out the whole Cayley table of its whole operation, and even if I did, maybe that wouldn't illuminate the structures that I really care about. Is there a way for me to say something about a group that I can't get my hands around by using other techniques? In this next set of videos, we're going to develop a very important concept in group theory, the concept of homomorphisms. Homomorphisms being functions that are like isomorphisms, but only tell us a little bit about the structure of a group, whereas isomorphisms tell us everything about the structure. So we want to develop what is a homomorphism from one group to another group, and in what sense can we use homomorphisms to compare and therefore to illustrate the structures in those two groups. The key principle being that a function which can preserve a structure, like the operation in a group, can also help us to illuminate the structure that exists in that group. And one of the important parallels that I'm going to draw in this series of videos is the parallel to linear algebra. In linear algebra, we learn about linear transformations, and one of the most important theorems about linear transformations in vector spaces is the one that tells us that inside every linear transformation is a hidden invertible linear transformation. So even if my linear transformation doesn't go both directions and give me a connection between two vector spaces that are the same, somehow within that linear transformation we can find two sub-objects which are the same between domain and range. And the idea of these videos will be to extend that intuition that we got from linear algebra from the linear case into the abstract group theoretic case of which the linear algebra result can be seen as a special case. So functions that preserve structure can also illuminate structure. And that's the theme of this set of videos. So here's an example. Suppose I start out with the cyclic group of order 12. It's just the clock group around a regular clock face. If I have an isomorphism that uses Z12 as its domain, then that isomorphism can only connect it to a group which is the same as Z12, some other cyclic group of order 12, for example. But can we find a way of comparing Z mod 12 to another group that might not be exactly the same, but has some similar properties. So for example, is there a way that I could compare Z12 to, I don't know, Z mod 3, the cyclic group that has three elements in it? And if I could, what would that comparison look like? And what could it tell me about Z12? So here's an example of a function that actually will give me a structure-preserving connection between Z12 and Z3. The function 5x equals x mod 3. So it just takes all these residues mod 12 and reduces them mod 3 to get a 0, a 1, or a 2. If we take a closer look at the properties that that function has, the first thing we might notice is that 0, the identity element in Z12, gets sent to 0, the identity element in Z3. That's kind of a good sign. Identity maps to identity, so there's some structure preservation that's happening with this function. In a similar way, all of the other multiples of 3, 0, 3, 6, and 9 inside of Z12, all of those are also going to be mapped to 0. So we have this whole subset of four elements of Z12 that's all getting sent to the identity element in Z3. And those four elements happen to form a subgroup of Z12. It's a subgroup generated by 3, for example. So here we have an entire subgroup of elements that's all getting sent to 0 in the target group. All right, what else can we say? Well, 1 gets mapped to 1 under this function. 1 mod 3 is going to give me 1. But there are other elements that also get mapped to 1. For example, 4 reduced mod 3 is going to give me 1. 7 reduced mod 3 is going to give me 1. 10 reduced mod 3 is going to give me 1. And if I highlight all four of those elements, the first thing we notice is that there's also four of them. Just as there were four elements that mapped to the identity, there are also four elements that map to 1. And the shape that those elements take on my clock face is awfully similar to the shape that the subgroup of elements that mapped to the identity did. And the same thing is true for the elements that map to 2. Reduce mod 3, 2 goes to 2, but so does 5, so does 8, and so does 11. So I have these four different elements that all map to 2. Again, the same 4 as the number of elements that map to 0 and the number of elements that map to 1. And there's a striking similarity between all three of those sets of elements they all had four elements in them, and they all mapped to a single image over here on the right. So there's something very illuminating 
about the way that this function connects z12 to z3. What it does is it takes and divides z12 into three sets of four. All the pre-images of 0, 0, 3, 6, and 9. All the pre-images of 1, 1, 4, 7, and 10. And all the pre-images of 2, 2, 5, 8, and 11. And each of those pre-images has the same number of elements. They're in bijection with one another. And moreover, they're also sort of cyclic in a way, right? The subgroup of elements that maps to 0 was indeed a cyclic group generated by 3. Or if you like, it could be generated by 9. These other sets aren't exactly cyclic because they're not subgroups, but they're awfully similar looking to the cyclic subgroup 0, 3, 6, 9. And so this function, because it does such a good job of respecting the operation, preserving the structure of Z mod 12, because it maps identity to identity and it maps all the elements in this nice predictable way from Z12 to Z3, rather than calling it an isomorphism, where iso comes from the Greek word for same, we call it a homomorphism. Homo coming from another Greek prefix that also means same, but not quite as same. And so think of this as similar. Morph means shape. Homo means similar. Similar shape. And notice the key role here that's being played by the identity element 0 in the target group, C3. This identity element's pre-image, 0, 3, 6, and 9, that's a subgroup of Z12. It's a very important subgroup that we call the kernel of this homomorphism. And if there's one concept that shines above all the others in this week's material, it is the idea of a kernel. It's the most important thing you can know about a homomorphism. What is its kernel? What is it sending to the identity element in the target group? And also, because that kernel in this example has four elements in it, it turns out that that kernel is also a cyclic, isomorphic to a cyclic group of order four. So it's isomorphic to Z4, if you like. But the fact that there are three sets of them also indicates that there's a Z3 hiding in this as well. That the three cosets of this subgroup, 0, 3, 6, 9, in Z12, are exactly 1, 4, 7, and 10, 2, 5, 8, and 11, and the original, 0, 3, 6, and 9. And therefore, those three cosets form a factor group, which is a group of order 3, and therefore is isomorphic to the cyclic group of order 3, because there's a unique group that has order 3. So... Just this homomorphism, just having this homomorphism from Z12 to Z3, has told me two things about my original group Z12. It's told me that there's a subgroup that's isomorphic to Z4 inside of it. That came from the kernel. But it also tells me that Z12 has a factor group that's isomorphic to Z3. It's a factor group of Z12 by this kernel of order 4. So what it accomplishes for us is it lets us learn a lot about a group by looking at homomorphisms that come out of that group. So if you can show me a homomorphism out of G, then I can use that homomorphism to tell you something about the structure of G. And that's the key process that we're working on this week. And the key connection is that kernel. The kernel consists of everything in the domain group, which is getting sent to the identity element in the target group. That kernel is not just a subgroup, but as we'll see, it is also a normal subgroup. And the factor group, by that normal subgroup, which is the kernel of this homomorphism, that factor group, it turns out, can be related to the image of this homomorphism inside of H. So we can learn a lot about normal subgroups of G by looking at homomorphisms out of G and vice versa. If we know something about the normal subgroups of G, we can also say something about the homomorphisms out of G. And that connection is the key to everything we do in this chapter. So the main blueprint looks like this. You give me a homomorphism from G to H. I look at the kernel of that homomorphism. That's everything in G that's getting sent to the identity in H. That kernel is a normal subgroup of G. And since the normal subgroups are exactly the building blocks of groups, that tells me something very important about the structure of G. So we're going to be able, for example, to use homomorphisms to discover and say something about the normal subgroups of G. But then we can also go the other direction. Because the cosets of the kernel, the cosets of this normal subgroup, are going to be in one-to-one -one correspondence with the image of the homomorphism inside of the target group. We can also go the other way and use homomorphisms to talk about not just the normal subgroup, but in fact the group of cosets, i.e. the factor group, of that normal subgroup. And all of this is going to boil down to the probably the most important structure theorem that we have in our whole first semester of abstract algebra, the first isomorphism theorem. 
which tells you exactly what I've been alluding to for the last couple of minutes here, which is that the factor group of the kernel, in other words, the group of the cosets of the kernel uh, of this homomorphism inside of G, and the image of the original homomorphism inside of H are copies of one another. They're isomorphic to one another. And in that sense, every homomorphism is hiding an isomorphism inside of it. An isomorphism between the factor group by the kernel in the domain and the image subgroup in the, in the target group on the right. And all of this is going to be a tool to let us use homomorphisms to obtain a partial set of information about a group, some of the structure of that group without necessarily getting all of it. And to do that, we're also going to need to contrast what are the properties of groups that do get preserved under homomorphism, and what are those that don't necessarily get preserved in the same way that they do with isomorphism, but can still be used to tell us something about the structure of the original group. So this is a really ambitious agenda uh, that we have. It's going to take us a lot of videos to get through, but this is the overview. Feel free to keep coming back to this as you go along, just to remind yourself of, of where we're at, why we're doing all of this. We want to use homomorphisms, and in particular, the first isomorphism theorem, to let us understand something about the structure of a group G just by knowing some homomorphism that comes out of G to some other group.